Roger. Roger, thank you so much for uh, accepting my invitation to interview you. It's a pleasure for me. So, um, uh, how long and why do you study and research about the cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system? Well, I started uh, in the late 1960s, so a very long time. And I got into it because I was doing, um, I did my PhD in, at Oxford University on anesthetics. And at the end of uh, that, um, my boss offered me a position to work as a postdoc on cannabis. And the reason he did that was because he was an expert on anesthetics, a pharmacologist. And he thought that maybe, uh, just maybe, some of the cannabinoids acted a bit like anesthetics, but not, not full anesthetics, but what we call partial anesthetics. So they might interact with membranes or cells to produce changes in the fluidity of the constituents of the membranes. So that's really um, the starting point. So I accepted this invitation. It was an interesting time for a number of reasons. First of all, um, we knew very little about um, cannabinoids. We knew ca cannabis had been known about for thousands of years, but the actual pharmacology of the individual constituents was really very little was known. Um, and also, of course, it was a time when um, recreational cannabis was emerging. So uh, it was another important reason for uh, studying it. So there are some good information about cannabis out there. Where I can find it? Oh, right. Um, well, you can read the literature, but uh, there's about, oh, I don't know, about 100 papers a week come out. Yes, it's uh, a lot. Because I do a weekly search, and there's a lot, an awful lot of publications, and um, not, all, not all necessarily on things you'd be interested in. Uh, but one possibility would be uh, for someone starting out would be actually to uh, uh, look at a book which I edited. Uh, it's about uh, four years old now. It's still reasonably up to date, therefore. And that's called The Handbook of Cannabis. Yeah. And uh, that might well be uh, of interest to people because it um, is reasonably uh, readable. It's got a huge index, so it's easy to find things. And um, the chapters are written by experts in various aspects of um, cannabis. And I mean all aspects, so we, we start really, we, we've got chapters on how to grow it, um, someone from GW Pharmaceuticals on how to grow it, yeah. the botany of it, the history of it, um, the potential therapeutic uses, um, the pharmacology, how the different constituents of cannabis work, as far as we know. A lot still to be learned on that, because a lot we don't know, but what we do know is, 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 is um, summarised in there. Stuff on recreational cannabis, stuff on medical cannabis, stuff on selling cannabis, so on coffee shops and uh, particularly on the shops in the USA and uh, how they functioned back in those days. So there's a lot of interesting and useful information, so it's a good starting point for someone. In your research field, have you considered medical cannabis as possible treatment for multiple sclerosis patients and why? Well, um, it's something which, uh, from a long time ago really, and back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, when I was reading newspapers, I came across articles by a lady uh, with multiple sclerosis who was a journalist but had to give, give up her job really because of her MS. But she wrote these articles about multiple sclerosis and how she found cannabis was the only drug really which worked for her multiple sclerosis. When it was? Um, it, uh, this was in the late 1980s or early 1990s. Okay. Yes, I can't remember the exact date. No, it's okay. Um, and, um, she actually wrote using not her real name because, uh, of course, it was she illegal was to take cannabis, yes. Um, so she, she wrote, so I got really interested in that. So I con contacted her and we just had discussions. And um, I think we did it by letter because it was really before emails were yeah, around. Sure. <laughs> and um, eventually um, it turned out that uh, she was part of a large group of patients who were self-medicating either in the UK or in the USA. And uh, through her and her uh, friends, we were able to um, contact all those, a lot of those patients, send them out questionnaires, which we compiled. That was me and a few of my uh, collaborators. And then uh, we got the replies to those questionnaires, and we wrote a paper on that, uh, because we were very impressed, because we got very similar replies from all these different people. And they sent the replies directly to us, not to anyone else first. So we believed them. And uh, certainly uh, the, the claims were it, was, it reduced the spasticity yeah. of multiple sclerosis as well as the pain and greatly improved sleep. So they slept much better and uh, that's why we took it. It worked much better than any of the drugs which were available yeah, as, as sure. actual medicines, which is why they took the, the cannabis and self-medicated. Yeah. I think that probably, that paper probably contributed to, um, to the uh, 
probably persuaded people that it's something that should be explored properly in clinical trials, which is what happened. And eventually, of course, um, a, a new drug did emerge, produced by DW Pharmaceuticals, um, which is a, a mixture of THC and cannabidiol called Sativex, and that is now used to treat uh, multiple sclerosis. In that time, the, that uh, reporter, she was using THC mostly. Cannabis. Yes, cannabis yes. in general. Yes. In, in which form? Like smoking? I don't know. Oh, I don't you know. Don't. Yeah. Because it's, it's I would imagine it was smoking. It's smoking, probably, yeah. yeah. Well, Roger, there are any considerations regarding the team that you'd like to say uh, or a message? We, and there's so many of the constituents of cannabis we know nothing about pharmacologically or medically, and we need to explore that. Yeah. And then we need to come up maybe with the best medicines which maximize the benefits and minimize the risks and decide if uh, for any of those it's better to go to a synthetic compound rather than a plant-derived compound or if it's best to stick with plant-derived compounds. I mentioned one example of that already with the uh, cannabidiolic acid analogue which is synthetic and the reason uh, we went for that one was because it's much more stable and there may be other uh, examples where that might be a good idea. Um, but we shall see. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah, and it uh, was really impressive. The stories are really, really nice to hear. And I'm super happy I could do it with you. Thank you so much. Oh, it was fun talking with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. you.